Hey and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and as usual we'll start with a couple of announcements. Tonight, August 6th, um, is our next intro to plant-based nutrition at 9 o'clock. It's our 90-minute power-packed um, workshop that shows you the science and skills to adopt and maintain a plant-based diet. It's taught by one of our excellent instructors, Lori Denman. She's so enthusiastic. She lives this lifestyle herself. You really want to learn from her. And then next Monday, Conversations with Chef Dell. He's going to talk about meals on the run. In other words, um, school lunches, work lunches, food to take to parties, tailgating, anytime you're going to be away from home and you need food that's portable and easy and acceptable to others as well for events, um, that's going to be the conversation. And of course, he will answer your questions on diet and health as well and food prep and all that kind of stuff. So uh, with that, we're continuing the series this week on whole, rethinking the science of nutrition. And I want to thank everybody who emailed me suggesting that I do this series. And the reason is that it caused me to go back through the book and really take a closer look at it and, um, and make these notes, which I'm sharing with you. But I've also used them so many times in uh, the last few weeks since I started doing this when I'm explaining concepts to others. I mean, Campbell's just such an amazing, amazing communicator. And those of you who've had an opportunity to hear him speak know what I'm talking about. So um, when we left off last week, we were talking about holistic versus reductionist ways of looking at research. And so I'm going to pick up there and talk about one holistic way to determine the ideal diet is biomimicry, looking at mammals like gorillas and chimps that are closest to us. And the reason this has merit, Campbell says, is that the diets of these animals haven't changed much. They're not influenced, obviously, by government and commercials. And their instincts may be better than ours. I guess I would go a step further and say they are better than ours. For example, the fact that there are big, strong animals that live on a plant-based diet refutes the idea that people must eat protein and, in order to gain strength and muscle. Our evolutionary biology is yet another holistic way to look at what might be the right diet for humans. The length of our digestive tracts, the shape of our teeth, the shape of our jaws, and the pH of our stomachs can be compared to herbivores versus carnivores. And if you do that, you'll find that humans have very little in common with the carnivores and lots in common with the herbivores. So then he shifts gears and he talks about the reductionist ways of looking at diet and health and why they may not be so effective. So perspective studies, the first example he uses, this is a type of study where one group is given an intervention and the other is not. The gold standard is supposed to be the double blind, randomized, controlled study. Well, it won't work so well for diet because obviously people know what they're eating. So the best you can do with this type of study is to use nutrients in a pill. And that really doesn't go to the idea that the dietary pattern may actually be the most important thing. And then he talks about case controlled studies, which compare people who have a disease to a similar group of people who don't have the disease. But, and, and the example he uses is say we're looking at women who have breast cancer and comparing um, those women to women who don't have breast cancer. Well, what characteristics do they have in common with one another versus the control group, etc.? Well, one thing that you might say is, well, more of the women with breast cancer are overweight. All right, well, if being overweight as a risk factor for breast cancer, what happens many times is the take home point is a recommendation to lose weight. And the problem here is that weight loss can, any type of weight loss program would work is the inference. And, and this includes ones that may not be very healthy and may actually have side effects, including inducing um, or increasing the risk of cancer, such as consuming low fat dairy products. So Campbell, the master of the analogy, I love this. He says, it's like saying that people who uh, smile are happier than depressed people. So we could invent a machine that stretches the face into a smile and automatically the depressed people would be happy. Well, it just completely ignores, when you isolate the smile, it ignores the idea that there are many, many factors that cause people to be happy or um, on the opposite side, cause people to be depressed. So these reductionists um, really use flawed methodology and it's very easy to come up with wrong conclusions. The major difference being that reduction, reductionism looks at single factors, holism looks at several factors, including the interaction of those factors. Um, holism says you can't pay attention to one factor and ignore the rest and end up with valid data. Um, but having said that, reductionist uh, studies are much more likely to get funding and unfortunately that constitutes, those types of studies constitute the biggest body of evidence on nutrition out there. 
Campbell rightly points out that while medicine made remarkable progress in the early 1900s, curing infections, transplanting organs, imaging with MRI machines, for example, we haven't really made much progress in medicine in the last several years. In countries like US, in fact, there has really been no improvement in preventing or curing degenerative diseases. In fact, there are prominent physicians who talk about coronary artery disease. I remember when Bill Clinton was going through his angioplasty and the head of the American Heart Association said, this is a chronic disease, we don't have a cure for it. Well, my gosh, then how do you explain Dr. Assistant's work? But people are still looking for magical solutions to health issues and there really aren't any. Campbell refers to the study of genetics as the ultimate reductionist fantasy. At one point, it allowed scientists to isolate a tiny piece of DNA as the reason why somebody had cancer or heart disease. Well, now it's being used to try to uh, predict who's gonna get disease, identifying mutations in order to tell people what types of diseases they're likely to develop. The problem is that in reality, genes can tell us what may happen, but not what will happen or when it will happen. While scientists can identify genes and therefore genetic predisposition, genetic expression is not predictable because it takes place through a very complex series of interactions that are impacted by all kinds of variables, including body chemistry, nutrition, medication, mood, and many, many other things. In spite of this, fans of the genetic theory of health and disease insist on pursuing theories based on a linear series of events and the idea that drugs can be developed that will somehow address these things. While Campbell finds the study of genetics fascinating from a science perspective, he reminds us that this endeavor cannot resolve what we refer to as foodborne illnesses uh, or degenerative diseases. These, these can only be addressed by, by looking at diet and that's the holistic point of view versus the reductionist point of view. You look at genes, everybody's looking at, let's find a mutation that predicts that you're gonna get a certain disease and do something to address that mutation, whereas holism says, let's look at all the factors that might impact your getting these, this particular disease or any disease for that matter, and, and let's look at the entirety of your diet and lifestyle and, and give you the best chance of avoiding those outcomes with the whole picture. So anyway, I'm gonna continue this on Thursday. Again, thanks to all of you who suggested that we do this series. Um, as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll talk to you again on Thursday.